Okay, I'm going to try this once again. This is already now take number four um, on PPM number eight. And once again, um, picking up where I left off yesterday, um, the key phrase came at the end. It's actually a quotation from Heidegger, and it was um, in it, the second half of the sentence that was in the last paragraph of the meditation. The sentence said, uh, the question delivers a message to us, and in doing so, places us in, rela in a relation. Quote, Heidegger, and the relation is called hermeneutical because it brings the tidings of that message. Unquote. And then I asked, what are the tidings that turn us, that catch and thrown us, throw us into learning? And in the next meditation, I take up further the matter of the question um, that bears the tidings, that is to say, that expresses the tidings of um, being. Tidings of being are what offer us up something to think about, and hence the hermeneutical relation is really the, for me, in the essence of the relationship of being and learning. It's hermeneutical. It's phenomenological, but it's phenomenological in the hermeneutical sense because it's not simply a description, but it's a description that is always interpretive and is always taking up and then in turn as an interpretation offering up what is in excess. So now on to PPM number eight, originally written February the 20th, 2004, 10 years ago today. When we respond to the question, how is it with the nothing, or any first question, that is a question which strikes us at the core of our being, takes us to the ground of our being, and as such shakes this ground, and opens this in originary source for inquiry, we are hearing the tidings of a message from that source, being, which makes possible our being in the world, and which by its address situates us in our questioning as questioners. First questions, in their address to us, locate us on the unstable ground of questioning. This ground is unstable precisely because it is an ever-shifting movement. Being is a process, an unfolding. When we respond to the address of this movement, we heed the tidings of the message, which is delivered in the provocative saying of the first question. The tidings of being express the temporality of our being. We are caught in the flood and wet ebb of being's tidings. See, when we are caught in the flood and ebb of being's tidings, we be have become attuned to our historicity, to the course and tendency of events. When we heed the call of the first question, we find ourselves caught in the tide of being. The tidings of being draw us into the tide. Tide means time, season, hour, a regular period of time. But it also designates the rise and fall of the sea due to the attraction of the sun and moon, and a rush of water, a flood, a torrent, a stream. Tide also means the course of tendency of events. All these signify the condition we find ourselves in as earthly mortal beings. Regularity coupled with unpredictability and with coupled with unpredictability regularity coupled with unpredictably powerful surges which exceed our expectations and make strange what we have anticipated. The first questions take us to the ground of our existence as earthly beings who are caught in this tide, who have been thrown into the seasons, the tidal movement of events history. The tidings deliver the message of the tide. Quote, everything depends on our paying heed to the claim arising out of thoughtful, out of the thoughtful word. Only in this way, paying heed to the claim, do we come to know the dictum. What man heeds with respect, what man heeds what respect he gives to the heated, 
how original and how constant he is in his heedfulness, that is what is decisive as regards the dignity allotted to man. All right. Out of history. End quote. We hear the tidings of the tide. Who is, what is said in the first question saying is a word that addresses us, provokes us, and evokes wonder, catches us, pulls us, directs us. We are enjoined in questioning by a claim. A claim is made upon us. A claim that offers a promise in the form of an assertion, a dictum. The word nothing addresses us in this way. Nothing makes a claim on us. How does it make a claim? In what way does it claim us? That's how I end. So once again, I end with questions. And in this particular um, meditation, I think that what stands out to me are a couple things. One, you wouldn't know this unless you were reading it, but when I write, the tidings of being draws into the tide, the tide is capitalized, capital T. The tidings of being draws into the tide, and then the tide will now operate throughout the writing. I know because having completed them, um, I'll come back again and again to the tide with a capital T. Um, tide means time, season, hour, a regular period of time. That's one denotation, but it also designates the more familiar sense of it, which is the rise and fall of the sea due to the attraction of the sun and the moon. Uh, tide also means the course of tendency of events. All these signify the conditions we find ourselves in um, as earthly mortal, mortal beings. And then the sentence that I had trouble reading, this is regularity the regularity of the tide, coupled with unpredictably powerful surges, which exceed our expectations and make strange what we have anticipated. So not just simply that the tide um, is, is irregular insofar as it isn't happening at the same time every day, but, you know, so low tide and high tide will change every day. So one day it's, you know, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and so forth, but that the tide itself will surge um, in terms of low and high, when it's a high tide, you'll get a flood, and that's obviously related to the other events that are going on in the uh, in the in the, the weather and in the environment, et cetera, et cetera. So the sense in which there's regularity, there is going to be a high tide and there is going to be a low tide, but the actual occurrence of those day in and day out is unpredictable insofar as the quality or nature. Um, um, specificity of that particular high and low tide. So I'm, I'm using all of this playing off of um, the quote from the prior day, which was uh, the tidings of the message, right? Um, that, go back to that sentence, um, it's right here. The relation is called hermeneutical because it brings the tidings of the message. So I'm really building on and playing with this idea of the tidings of the message, the message of evocative saying, the message of the provocative question, and then um, um, playing with this idea of the tidings, that is to say the excess um, that makes it hermeneutical, that is to say that offers us up something to interpret and to think about, and then now talking about this as uh, a manifestation of the tide which is the tide of being, and the tide of being, uh, the excess of, of existence, if you will, the, the, what, what exceeds our expectations, what also what offers us up, um, something to do, something to think about. Um, it taught, from a temporal point of view, the, the tide is simply uh, the, the, the unknown yet uh, impending or imminent future, the future that is still to be, the future that is to come. Um, this is the excess, if you will, of the present, is the, is, is, is the future. And I emphasize this a lot in the writing. Um, there's also the excess of the past, um, the unresolved um, and incompleteness of the past, things that are left undone that we still uh, uh, have to take up. And the concepts, I was talking about this in my class that I taught this morning, um, the, 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 the language or the concept of, of, of ancient philosophy um, and, and the texts that we study 
are incomplete in this sense, right? And they still um, are demanding that we take them up and that we read them and they discuss them. So there is a certain um, unresolved or incomplete quality or character of the words of the past, of the text of the past, uh, specifically in the tradition of philosophy. So the tide um, of being uh, manifests itself both as the incompleteness of the past as well as the uh, incompleteness or not, not yet uh, uh, not yet happening or n not yetness of the future, the fact that the future remains still to come. So there's this uh, what 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 uh, Giorgio Agamben calls um, the time that remains, right? It's that that's the chirological, and, the, and so the 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 tide of being um, throws us, captures us, takes us, and places us into uh, the the chirological. Right, the, the, the chirological moment where thinking happens, and so what I'm suggesting is that the provocative question is is a is an expression or is a is it arises from an attunement of uh, of the tide of being. Right. So, uh, if hopefully I'll be able to uh, to capture this on the video, which has been this is now the fourth take on this, but I do want to say that. Um, that, that this isn't significant and important uh, uh, this week in particular because you know this was the 50th anniversary of Hannah Arendt coming to campus it was, uh, the 18th which was uh, two days ago of February the 50th anniversary she came in 1964 she delivered a presentation on Eichmann and um, in the course of that presentation I, I, I read it and commemorated it on, and I made a video of, of, of reading that I have the original um, notes a copy of them and in the fourth point of that presentation she was talking about judgment. Now, for Arendt, judgment is our, our, our capacity to tell what she says right from wrong, uh, 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 good from bad. And w the judgment arises from thinking. Um, there's a certain spontaneity that's also the character, but my, my understanding of it is that judgment is thinking of its appearance in the world, right? So if thinking is this quiet uh, uh, a conversation, silent dialogue we have with ourselves. A judgment is its manifestation in the world because it's, 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 it's thinking um, um, in the form of its attention towards the world. But what's important for Ren, and she wrote this in her in the last part of that fourth uh, uh, point that she made in her notes, she put in parentheses something that is classically Ren, and it's just simply the three word, words, stop and think. It's almost an aphorism or a maxim for Rent. So our capacity to have judgment, uh, to tell right from wrong, and what she says, it may prevent us from, from, from evil from appearing in the world, certainly in the form of what she calls the banality of evil, of which Eichmann was the embodiment of. And she discovered this banality of evil in her observations of the Eichmann trial. This is what she presented here at Hofstra. Um, you know, what prevents the banality of evil, what seems to, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a conjecture, is thinking. So we need to stop and think. So what I'm suggesting is that that when we stop and think, we are sort of entering into this uh, um, uh, the, the excess of being, uh, the chirological, uh, what the time that remains, and the time and the tide of being draws us into that. This is what I'm suggesting. So this was then uh, PPM number eight. Um, I'm speaking very quickly, and I'm ending rather quickly, uh, or abruptly rather, in, in just 13 minutes because. This is the fourth take of this, and I want to. I'm really anxious to make sure that it's 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 saved so that I can post it uh, up on uh, on the, on the blog. Uh, so uh, until tomorrow.